Hi. In the previous video, we formally developed Kuhn Tucker conditions. Well, we developed one version of them. The full version is coming uh, in the next video. However, before we get to the uh, to the most general case of n variables and n variables and n constraints, let's get a little bit more intuition behind uh, Kuhn Tucker conditions and the relation uh, to the maximization uh, under inequality constraints. Okay, so we let's do the simplest problem possible. So we need to maximize some function f of x1 just one variable and we've got just one inequality constraint. The simplest possible you could say because we just require x1 to be lower than some other one. Or equal to, of course. And of course we require uh, x1 to be non-negative. Okay, so if we if we want to solve this problem, of course we start with the Lagrange function, which is kind of an overkill here, but this is why we chosen this this uh, option because it's really easy uh, problem to solve. So first we're going to have x one, then plus lambda one times r one minus x one. Okay, now let's take Kuhn Tucker conditions for Maxi. Okay, so first thing we need to differentiate Z with respect to X1, which is simply, uh, which I'm going to simply write as F prime. Right? It's just a function of one variable. Uh, yeah, and minus lambda. At the same time, we know that this, of course, needs to be lower or equal to zero. We need to require that x1 is higher or equal to zero, and by complementary slackness, x1. And times derivative dz dx1, which is equal to this. No, but maybe let's already write it like this f prime minus lambda 1 must be equal to 0, which means that this or this, of course, must be equal to 0. Then the second set of conditions, we get, to get the second set of conditions, we first differentiate z with respect to lambda and of course then we get restatement of the restriction and we of course now uh, require this to be higher or equal to zero with lambda one being higher or equal to zero and one of them so lambda or R1 minus X1 need to be equal to 0. Okay, over here, we've got three possible cases that we can have. First two are the cases that are very common, and case number three is a special case, which of course might happen. However, this is not our primary concern. We're going to go through it. However, the key to understanding the problem is what we see over here. And let's start with the case, let's call it A. What do we see over here? Here, we've got a situation where our function reaches maximum, which is given to us by uh, uh, by the derivative equal to 
zero, right, at the top, before x1 reaches r1. In other words, we've got interior solution, or we might also say that the restriction is not binding, right? We've been able, we were, let's just say, we we're lucky enough to find A before restrictions uh, started uh, to, do, to give us any trouble. Okay, so if this is the case, and we see what is happening over here, let's, uh, let's write down everything, oh, let me just, uh, oh, oh, I think this is better, good. Let me just write down all the information we got. Look, first thing we see is at maximum, first derivative of the function is equal to zero. Right? What else do we see? We see that the maximum x1 is positive. What else do we see? So, okay, before we get to what else we see, what this is going to imply to us? Look, if I know that the derivative is first derivative is zero, right? We, this is the only thing that remains out of the constraint. So we, right away we can notice that lambda one is, uh, lambda one is higher or equal to zero, right? Makes perfect sense. Okay, then we also see that uh, that x1 is bigger than 0. And if x1 is bigger than 0, then due to complementary slackness, we know that this expression must be equal to 0. However, with f prime being equal to 0, we see that lambda, negative lambda must be, uh, 1 must be equal to 0, or that lambda must be equal to zero as well. Okay, however, we see a little bit more. Look, we can also see that R1 is bigger than X1. Well, this implies that R1 minus X1 is bigger than zero. And again, due to complementary slackness, Right? If this is bigger than zero, it means that our lambda in fact needs to be equal to zero. And look, this actually is showing us that every time when we get lambda that is equal to zero, condition, a uh, restriction, I'm sorry, is non binding. It means we still have some room to maneuver and it means we've reached maximum uh, we've reached maximum uh, before we got to the restraint uh, to the constraint. But look, let's go one step further. Look, what we see over here is that in the maximization process that we've got, that we are doing, uh, that we are going through, we see that this expression is positive, however lambda is making it disappear, right? And look, what we are actually doing here is a regular, a regular optimization, right, where in this special case we do not even need to care about that. Okay, so what about case B? Well, in this case, we clearly see that if we would be going like this along the x1 axis, we would be finding bigger and bigger values of the function. We haven't reached the maximum here yet, right? So, 
How would we describe this situation? Well, first thing I can notice is that F prime over here is clearly bigger than zero. Right? We see that at the point where we find the highest value, the slope of the function is actually positive. Okay. But then we also notice that x1 is positive as well. Okay, what is this implying to us? Now, let me remind you that this is a very special case and it's not always that, uh, that everything is not always uh, looking so smoothly. However, look, we can calculate out now, due to complementary slackness, that this must be equal to zero, right? Which tells us that lambda is equal to f prime and it's bigger than zero. Okay, let's go one step further. What do we get from here? We know that actually r1 and x1 are exactly at the same point, right? Okay, which means that R1 minus X1, um, maybe let's use asterisks here, is zero. Okay, this again implies to us that lambda one should be higher than 0. And look, in this, in this circumstance, lambda is a positive number. Every time when we get that lambda is a positive number, it means that we are at the constraint, right? This is 0, right? So this vanishes, of course, the, the expression vanishes. However, it vanishes due to a different reason. Okay, and finally, the last case, case number three. This is a special case, but let's see it anyway because it's kind of interesting. Okay, what do we see over here? We see the first derivative is zero, right? We are at the top. However, look, in this case, it happens that top of the function, right, the maximum, is at the constraint, right? This is why it would be a special case. Of course, we see that x1 is bigger than 0. And again, we end up in the same scenario. Lambda 1 must be equal to 0 which again says that we are at the constraint. So constraint is fine. Moving on, we would get here, of course, that R1 minus X1 is equal to zero. Uh, it is equal to zero. And this actually implies that lambda doesn't need to be equal to zero, right? However, when we talk about complementary slackness, it means that at least one of them needs to be equal to zero. And in this special circumstance, they're both, they're both equal to zero. Okay, so these are the three possible cases we can have. Of course, we can extend the analysis to three dimensions, and then to more dimensions without, of course, the option of plotting it. However, I believe it should give you a sense, a very good sense, how Kuhn-Tucker condition works. And with this out of the way, in the next video, we can actually introduce how conditions for both maximum and Kuhn-Tucker condition for maximization and minimization works 
for the case where we have function of n variables and we actually have n different constraints. Thank you for your attention and see you in the next video. Take care.